This section on DMET console software is about allele translation with a focus on performing translations and the content of the comprehensive and summary reports. Let's start by opening some existing data. I'm going to double click a, pro a workspace to launch DMET console. Select my user profile. Verify that this is the workspace I wanted to open. It has 42 cell intensity files, 41 gene type results files or chips, so we have some data that we can do allele translation on. Number of ways to initiate allele translation. Um, I would like to specifically set, select the set of cell files I want to do translation on, so I can do that by right clicking on the inbounds or passing subset of chip files and saying perform your little translations like this. Perform translation dialog opens. You first need to select where you want to save your results. I prefer to save it in a subfolder of the folder that contains the chip files that I used as inputs. Since a set of files are being generated, it will create a new folder and this will also be the root of all the report names. I'll just start by making it shorter. I'm not going to change any of the options. I'll cover those later. I will include sample attributes, so sample information from the AR files will be appended to the translation reports. For this analysis, the translation uses the following library files. The allele translation file, which stores the information for going from the marker level genotypes to the star allele names. And the metabolizer bin file, which stores the information from going from a pair of star allele names or diplotypes to the predicted phenotypes. So we have everything we need. Let's start translations. When the translation operation completes, a f window will open showing the files that have been generated. Unlike the cell intensity files and the chip files and sample files, translation results are not managed within the workspace. Six files are generated. Four of them are reports on the data. Starting from the largest, we have the comprehensive report, which stores the haplotype calls in addition to information uh, needed to call the haplotypes on every single marker. The summary report is similar to the comprehensive report, except that it only supplies the subset of markers for which there's relevant information, and I'll talk about that more. The phenotype report is the predicted enzyme phenotypes in addition to the underlying haplotypes used to call those. The uncalled report is basically a list of missing calls, no calls, possible rare alleles, um, and it can also be used as a template to replace those calls. Before I show an example of the uh, summary report, which is very similar to the comprehensive report, I thought I'd show you the structure. Basically, it's a regular table, uh, one row for every marker that's being used for translation. Those are the green rows. Because a set of markers is used to call the haplotypes, the star alleles, uh, there's one block of information uh, that summarizes the information from all these markers into one haplotype call. And there's one of these haplotype blocks, haplotype names, for every gene. And there's a set of genes that are being translated for a particular chip or array name. And if you include the sample attributes, that information will appear at the end. I've just opened a summary report into Excel and reformatted the data sections to the same colors as the previous slide. The reports all have header information uh, followed by the regular table. Let me adjust this a little bit. So column A is just uh, an index for sorting the columns. Don't need to look at that anymore. Column B is the name of the chip files. So here we've got test 2 to test 42. Let me make that a little smaller. 
and then we have the main sections. For each sample, starting with test 2, we have a set of genes, and within each gene we have the predicted haplotype uh, call. And then for each gene we have the set of underlying marker information that's used to make that call. And we finish up with sample information. So let's start with the base calls. So everything in boldface is data. Things that aren't in boldface is reference information. So starting with the base call, uh, G to A, the translation table identifies which is the reference base, which is the variant base, and uses that to make a reference or variant call. So in this case, we have a combination of a reference call and a variant call. The summary report, unlike the comprehensive report, doesn't list every single marker for every gene. It only lists the subset of markers that are either calling variant or have missing data, and it also only calls the subset of those that, when they do call variant, have an impact on the form of the gene in the sense that they change the amino acid or that they affect the promoter or the expression level. So synonymous changes that don't change the amino acid, for example, those markers aren't reported even if they change to a variant state. This is only in the summary report that I'm talking about. So let's look at this uh, for a particular gene. We have, uh, let's filter on, let's say, 2D6. And let's filter this out even more. So within this, let's on the haplotypes, we have different interpretation codes. The interpretation codes are listed in the header of what they mean. They're basic way of annotating what the known call is. Let's start with the most straightforward interpretation code, unique, in which samples have that code. Uh, let's start with this row. So we have star 1, star 1 being called. It's been given unique code because that's the only known call that's, that can be reported based on the observed genotypes. And the marker information is actually abbreviated down to only a sentence. All markers responsible for functional changes are ref ref. In other words, uh, there are no variant markers for this sample that, that impact the, the function of the gene. This is what's called the, the wild type allele. It's called star one, star one. And the in the summary report, that's the only information you get. Let's look at another unique call, star one, star six. Here, one marker is reported. It's reporting a heterozygous deletion of a T. So it's given a, a reference or variant call. It's the only marker among the CYP2D6 markers on DMIT Plus that is reporting a variant call. This marker is actually considered the defining allele for the star 6 haplotype. And since we're heterozygous for it, we're giving it a star 1, star 6 call. Let's look at one where we've got more answers. So star 29, star 29. For this sample, we have four markers that are calling variant variant, three of whom are used for haplotyping. So let's see if we can predict the star 29, star 29 call. This relevant allele column specifies which alleles this particular marker can be variant in. For this particular example, when this marker is a variant, it appears only in the star 29 allele. Therefore, this marker by itself can be used to make the star 29, star 29 call because we are homozygous variant. Let's see if the other markers agree with that identification. 
This fourth marker also used for haplotyping according to the relevant alleles column only in the star 29 allele does this marker appear variant and it is homozygous variant so this this marker backs up the second marker for calling star 29. What about this third marker here? There's turns out there's a lot of alleles for which this marker is variant. Let's look at the top here. All of these star alleles list this marker as a variant. One of them is star 29. So if you did have uh, two star 29 alleles, this pattern of genotypes is consistent with the star 29, star 29 call. So that's the unique code. Let's look at missing data code. NCPRANA stands for no call, possible rare allele, or not available missing data. And let's look at this uh, last one, sample 41. There's only one marker listed here, and it is given a no call. What this means is none of the other markers are calling variant. And all we have to determine anything that's different from the wild type of star 1, star 1 allele is potentially this marker. However, it's calling a no call. So we don't know if this marker is reference or variant, or whether it's heterozygous variant or homozygous variant. If it were a variant, this marker appears only in the star 6 allele. So because we don't know the status of this marker, the possible haplotypes or diplotypes that are reported are either pure wild type, if this marker is homozygous for the wild type, star 1, star 6, if this marker is heterozygous, or star 6, star 6, if this marker is homozygous mutant. So when you get multiple possible diplotypes being reported, Look at the interpretation code, and that may tell you uh, why you might be getting multiple answers. In this case, it's likely because you have missing data. That's leading to some ambiguity as to what the true call is. Let's switch to another interpretation code, uh, UMDH, which is an undefined haplotype. Only haplotype pairs with undefined haplotypes are possible. What does this mean? Well, let's look at this uh, one sample that has this undefined haplotype call. So the set of base calls leads to this combination of reference and variant base calls. And when this is compared to the set of available star allele names or haplotypes that are in the translation table, there is no two-pair combination of haplotypes that's consistent with this observed data. So put another way, this patient has a haplotype or one form of their allele that is not defined in the translation table. This will happen for some genes uh, that are not as well studied. This will also happen for, you know, a small set of samples when there are multiple variant calls. In that case, when we can't make an unambiguous pair of star allele calls, the known call field is empty. We have an undefined haplotype code, which explains why the known call field is empty. And the, uncall, the unknown call field kicks in as being valuable. Let's see what we got here. So based on the pattern of observed genotypes, it could be any one of the following comma separated uh, diplotypes. It could be star 1 plus an unknown haplotype, star 2 plus an unknown haplotype, star 4 plus an unknown haplotype, star 6 or star 10 plus an unknown haplotype, or a combination of two haplotypes that aren't defined in the translation table. Let's look at one more interpretation code. I've turned off filtering, and I will now filter to only samples that have the multiple interpretation code. So multiple is multiple haplotype pairs are possible due to phase ambiguity. So let's take one example. 
here we have SIP 182. Let's just filter on that one. So here we have a sample that has three markers whose pattern of base calls leads to this pattern of reference variant calls. Two of the markers are used for haplotyping. And so here we have the question of saying, are these two heterozygous are these two variants on the same copy of the chromosome or on uh, op uh, different copies of the chromosome? And depending on which they are, that leads to a different interpretation. And both interpretations are reported. In this case, star 1a uh, haplotype is no variance and star 1l means both markers are variant on the same chromosome. Star 1c and star 1f are the names of the alleles when one variant is on one chromosome and the other variant is on the other chromosome. So both are possible. The multiple code is given.